Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you as your grateful children, and we ask you to enable us to have clear minds and open hearts in these moments and in every moment. And we offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Endlessly hardworking and eternally optimistic. That's the phrase that pays from my message today. It's what I hope you will take with you. It's a daily goal for all of us to be certain. And it's also a connector to the blog that I wrote earlier this week as an introduction of today's theme. If you haven't read the blog, you can go to our church's website to see that. Or if you'd like, you can go to the Welcome Center to pick up a paper copy of it today. You know, the nice thing about a blog is that it's limited to 300 words. So if it's painful for you, it's a really brief kind of pain. And it does create the ironic humor with the comparison between the elements of pain and the difference in length between blogs and sermons, particularly when associate pastors who don't preach often are presenting the sermon. I want you to know I'm aware of this, I have this in mind, and I have your best interest at heart. <laughs> the late Tim Russert of NBC News wrote a wonderful book about his father and his family's legacy called Big Russ and Me. He talked about what it was like growing up in Buffalo, New York, and he shared countless stories about his dad. Big Russ had served as commander of the American Legion post, and on one occasion, Russert had a chance to hear his father and his buddies talk about what it was like to return home from World War II. Big Russ said, we wanted community. We wanted a home. We wanted a good reputation with our kids. What's the old saying? Your nose to the grindstone and hope for the best. Russert went on to say, that expression captures the essence of my dad. Endlessly hardworking, and eternally optimistic. And for those of us who remember watching Tim Russert work on TV, we know that he took that phrase literally. And he did his best to pass on that birthright to his son Luke, who is now a 28-year-old correspondent with NBC. In the epilogue of the book, Tim shared this letter. Dear Luke, I wrote this book for your grandpa. As I finish it, I realize how much it is also for you. To this day, grandpa believes that his glass is not only half full, it is actually two-thirds full. Or as he would say, I am truly blessed. And so are you. In the fall, you'll leave for college. Whenever you think your studies are tough, think about grandpa. Think about the example that he set and the lessons he taught about work and respect and discipline. They're as important for you as they have been for me. But remember, while you are always, always loved, you are never, never entitled to live a good, faithful, and meaningful life would be the ultimate affirmation of Grandpa's lessons and values. You see, my thesis today is really pretty simple. That just like privileges and possessions, our values are the birthrights that we inherit from our family and from our faith. And if we aren't careful, we can shuffle off and forget about them. And when that happens, our lives become so very diminished. The original context for my thesis is the story of Esau and Jacob 
Now you have some choices here. You can remember and imagine Martin reading the story from up here, or you can recall Dr. Smith sharing the story from down here. Either way, it's all good, and it all works. It's the story of Isaac and Rebecca, the story of a mother who desperately wanted to be pregnant, and then once she was, because of all the fighting and tussling and, and horseplay going on inside her, she thought, nah, this maybe was not such a great idea. But she gave birth. She gave birth to twins. We know now that the first child was born red all over, covered with hair, so he was named Esau, which meant ruddy. The second child came out gripping Esau's heel, struggling to be first, so he was named Jacob, which means grasp the heel. Esau loved to work outdoors, and Jacob preferred to stay in home, at home inside. Isaac loved his older son, perhaps because he was older and would ultimately receive the, the family birthright, or perhaps because Esau was a good hunter and Isaac enjoyed an occasional steak. On the other hand, the text simply says that Rebekah loved Jacob. So if you remember the refrain of the rap, what we have here is a hairy situation. <laughs> the problems began on that day when Jacob was cooking up some stew, and the smell of it created some temporary insanity for Esau. He came in and said, I'm starving. Jacob, the grabber, shrewdly realized that he had a window of opportunity, and he said, okay, I'll trade you some lunch for your birthright. Esau had no problems with that because he felt like he was going to die anyway if he didn't eat. And so he did it. He sold his incredibly valuable inheritance to his younger brother. As verse 34 said, Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. He ate, drank, got up, and left, showing just how little he thought of his birthright. One of the definitions of the word shuffle is to move things or people into a different order or into different positions. Given that, the story of Esau and Jacob involves shuffling in more than one way. Jacob is trying to reshuffle the deck to receive the elder son's privileged birthright. In Esau, Esau is too easily willing to shuffle away from his role of leadership in the family. And because of this, I think most of us who read the story today are tempted to just call Esau an idiot and move on our way. But that would be both easy and hypocritical. It's easy because it doesn't take into account how the story continues to evolve over the next eight chapters. And it's hypocritical because it gives the illusion that none of us today could possibly make that same kind of mistake that Esau did. Please. Here's the neat thing, I think, about that extended section in Genesis. By the time we get to chapter 33, Esau has been transformed from a slow-minded, vengeful older brother who wants to take Jacob's life to now being a gracious and forgiving brother who actually welcomes his little brother home. One of the most beautiful scenes in all of the Old Testament is that moment when Jacob fully expects to be slaughtered by Esau, yet Esau runs to meet him, throws his arms around his neck, gives him a kiss, and weeps. It's as if we're seeing a prelude to the parable of the prodigal son. Esau now seems to understand that a true birthright has much more to do with values 
than it does with property or possessions. Esau gets it, but do we get it? How often have we shown how little we thought of our values and our birthrights? In how many occasions have we practiced the exact opposite of endless hard work and eternal optimism? I can't answer that for any of you, but I can answer it for me, and I can confess it for myself. I know how many times my mind replays the film clips of my selfishness and my sinfulness of the past, far more than I want to admit. My parents entrusted me with a family birthright, and my faith entrusts me with a sacred birthright. Every morning that I get a chance to wake up, I have the opportunity to say once again, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace, and really mean it, and then try to really practice it. And speaking of birthrights, what about the values that we United Methodists have inherited from John Wesley? We are proud members of the Christian family who care for and respect our brothers and sisters in every denomination. We are ecumenical to the core. And we also are the beneficiaries of a distinctive structure and theology. The largest United Methodist Church in the United States is the Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City. Their senior pastor is Adam Hamilton, and for the past few months, he has gathered leaders around the country to think about and to pray about and to begin to speak about the most significant challenges that face our denomination. Hamilton writes about what unites us as United Methodists. And in his opening examples, he says this, to be United Methodist is to believe, follow, and serve Jesus Christ. It is to hold together a passionate and personal evangelical gospel and a serious and sacrificial social gospel. It's to hold together a deep and wide understanding of grace and a call to holiness of heart and life. It is to hold together a faith that speaks to the intellect and a faith that warms the heart. What unites us are the birthrights that nourish us, kind of like a tasty bowl of stew that we can enjoy without needing to sell our inheritance. I have no doubt that all of us will be hearing more about the work of Adam Hamilton and other United Methodist leaders in the months and the years ahead. And in the meantime, they deserve our prayers of support. Earlier in my message, I referenced events of the past weeks which took me to those unexpected places to see the birthrights and to see the grace of God at work. And I'm far too old now to be surprised by any of this. See, I tend to start every day with my overly controlled agenda. And then by lunchtime, God has replaced my agenda with one of real value. So here are just two examples. The first being a national story, and the second being a local story with far greater impact. I'm coming home. These were the words of LeBron James on SportsIllustrated.com Friday in announcing that he will leave the Miami Heat to return to his home state and play for the Cleveland Cavaliers next season. I've never been much of a LeBron fan. Since I grew up near Chicago, I never, compare, I never cared for the comparisons between him 
and my Michael Jordan. You know what I'm saying, Katie. Between him and our Michael Jordan. No, 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 no. And I also hated the fact that he was so arrogant and so disrespectful to Dirk Nowitzki and the Mavericks back in 2011, even in defeat. But now, I admit to being kind of impressed with his statement on Friday. Before anyone cared where I would play basketball, I was a kid from Northeast Ohio. It's where I walked, where I ran, where I cried. It holds a special place in my heart. My relationship with Northeast Ohio is bigger than basketball. I didn't realize it four years ago. I do now. I want kids there to realize that there's no better place to grow up. Maybe some of them will go off to college and then come home and start a family or open a business. That would make me smile. I honestly hope that LeBron James has a homecoming that makes a difference for him and makes a difference for that community. Because all of us deserve a second chance to accept a birthright. Now here's my second example from right here in our church family and far more significant. Carolyn Wynn died this past Monday, and the celebration of her life was here in our sanctuary on Thursday. Carolyn and her husband Herschel have been members of our church and the loyalty class for about 30 years now. It was just two years ago that she was diagnosed with progressive muscular atrophy. And in these two years, she has accelerated her lifetime practice of offering loving birthrights to her family and to her friends. She's always worked hard, was always busy, according to her family, never had time for a nap. She was the force behind the first public library in Burleson. And in 2011, she and Herschel made a gift to Harris Hospital that created an NICU family support room in memory of their daughter, Celia. Carolyn used the final months and weeks of her life to add to the already impressive list of birthright values that she left for her family. Her five granddaughters, for example, will always have her Mimi-isms to remember and to use in shaping the course of their lives. And speaking of remembering, I will never forget the scene that I saw 10 days ago. Carolyn was sitting in a chair, smiling, laughing, and crying with some of the members of her extended family. And in that moment, she was truly caring for them. She came to see these past days as her witness, her witness that none of us should be afraid of death and that all of us can give thanks for the inheritance that God gives us in this life and in the life to come. I started my message with the phrase that pays. Let me end with it as well. May all of us do our very best to be endlessly hardworking and eternally optimistic. May we always know that we are loved. And may we never, ever shuffle away from the values and the birthrights that God showers upon us. Thanks be to God. Amen.